Hi everyone, just a quick message before today's podcast episode. Uh, we've got some really exciting news and that is that we are delighted to announce that we are going to be joined once a month uh, by Connor Schwab from Sage Outdoor Advisory, who's going to be a co-host with me on, on an episode one, once every month. Um, I've known Connor for over a year now. Uh, we've become good friends. Uh, I first met him when we were scouting out the, the North American glamping industry prior to the launch of Glamper Tech North America. And um, we've since grew our relationship over, over the months. Um, and we've exchanged a lot of business and he's actually come on the podcast uh, twice, uh, which is way, way, how you may remember him. Uh, he's given some really good insights into the data and financial sides of the glamping industry. Uh, and that's what we hope he's going to uh, lean into uh, in the episodes that he is co-hosting with me. Um, so, Connor, uh, just before we get into today's episode, would you like to just share a few thoughts on what you think you're going to bring to the podcast? Thank you, Nick. And it's, it's an honor to be here. I've been so impressed with um, how much value you've been able to bring to the industry through this podcast and basically becoming, you know, the voice of the glamping industry. So it's an honor to, to get to be a part of this. And it's something that's certainly close to my heart. Um, I kind of got into the space in 2018 when I did my um, MBA in, um, in glamping and privatized camping and was looking to launch my own business. So I've been in the, in the shoes of the entrepreneur bootstrapping. Um, and then I ended up having an opportunity to come work at Sage Outdoor Advisory. And what we do is we essentially do feasibility studies and appraisals for launching uh, outdoor hospitality and glamping projects across the, the US. We've actually done 230. And so that gives me a chance to look at, you know, dozen, hundreds of, of projects in the country. And essentially we're really diving into the numbers and the financial projections to make sure that they make sense um, and helping people refine their models so that they can run a profitable business. So we're looking a lot at the numbers, looking a lot at the data. And so, um, you know, we thought that th that would be a good insight that I could bring to the listeners. So happy to be here. Amazing. As I say, we're, we're delighted to have Connor on. Uh, he's going to be joining us once a month. Uh, and that's starting today's episode with the amazing Sarah Dusick from Under Canvas. So without further ado, on to today's episode. Hello and welcome back to the Starter Glamping Business Podcast. We are doubly excited today. Not only do we have a really special guest, we've also got uh, our good friend Connor Schwab's first appearance as the co-host on this podcast. So Connor, first of all, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thrilled to be here. And today's guest is, is one of the most impressive people we've had on the podcast. Um, really, she's the pioneer of the North American glamping industry. Uh, she's the founder of Under Canvas, which, as you're probably aware, is, is one of the best known brands in, in the glamping industry, in, in not just North America, but the world. Uh, and we're really excited to dig into her background, Under Canvas's founding story, um, and all the trials and tribulations they had along the way as well. Um, Connor, I know you've also got a few words you want to say about Sarah to tee things up as well. Yeah, Nick, when you asked me to be uh, a co-host on the show to have some special guests. I, I knew I wanted the first guest to be Sarah and um, that's kind of for two major reasons. And, and one is I, I don't think the, the North American kind of glamping industry would really be here or certainly not in the form that it's at without Sarah and the, the role that she played as a pioneer. Um, especially I've been kind of following under canvas since I did my master's in 2018 and um, doing a lot of feasibility studies and business projections in the industry. I can't tell you how important it is for new launching businesses to be able to point to a successful business in the industry and say, oh, hey, Under Canvas is doing this and being successful in this way. So that gives um, maybe trepidatious investors the confidence to go into a new and largely unproven market like, like glamping. And What's crazy is that when Sarah came into this market, there there was no one for her to point to here. There was no one for her to go to her investors and say, hey, this business is doing well in this market. We think we can too. She had to, to build it from the ground up, which is, which is incredibly difficult. And kind of the success that you've had throughout your journey is, is remarkable. And I think the second thing, which is close to my own heart, is that um, you know with Under Canvas, as well as with your new ventures with Enigma and Quiver Tree Collection, um, they're very purpose-driven uh, and grounded in uh, kind of a, a higher calling in, uh, in environmental stewardship and conservation, um, women in entrepreneurship. And I just think it's so impressive how you've um, joined those two things and being a, a successful entrepreneur, but also 
having this greater underlying purpose that kind of grounds what you do. And I think they feed off each other so well. And you're just a great role model to everyone in the industry. So thanks for everything you've done for everyone in the industry. We owe you a lot. And I'm super excited for this episode. Thanks. I think you should just replace me, Connor. That was a far better <laughs> intro than I've ever done. Um, <laughs> so, uh, Sarah, before we, we dive into into the, the whole story of Under Canvas, um, there's, as I say, you, you know, there are a lot of risks taken, a lot of trailblazing, and it's a really exciting journey. But before we go into all of that, could you just explain for those who, who aren't aware what Under Canvas is, kind of the experiences you create, the structures you have, and just give a general overview of the business? Yeah, when we launched Under Canvas, um, the idea was to recreate the African safari experience in the United States. So what we ended up building was large scale tented camps outside of national parks across the US. And we started with one. We started with where my husband's from. I married um, a Montanan almost 20 years ago. And uh, when I first got to Montana, there was a lot of tears because there's not a lot of people in Montana. Montana looks a lot like Africa. And I had spent my early 20s in Africa um, with big, wide open spaces, prairies, you know, lots of wild animals. Um, but that's when we had this crazy idea that maybe we could make the wild a bit more tame in that we could, you know, enhance being out in the wilderness without it being scary and without it being uncomfortable and without it being um, difficult or dirty to do. So that was the idea. Could we, could we really recreate something that has been in existence for like over a hundred years in Africa and bring it to the United States in a way that would work for the American market? Okay, and, and, and today, like under Canvas, you've got kind of uh, the, the main brand, you've also got a sister brand. So how many um, locations do you have? How many structures do you have deployed? And, and could you just tell us a little bit about uh, about the main brand and then the sister brand as well? Yeah, um, I think we're at 12 locations now. I may have lost track. Uh, I think we're 12, but there's always some somewhere new opening. Um, and this year was no different. And um, the sister brand was launched this year with the idea of creating an even more upscale product um, in a great market for us, which is in just outside of Moab. Um, and that was launched on an amazing piece of property with its own arch, uh, its own, you know, lots of trails, lots of place, space to explore right there at the camp itself. Um, and that is called a loom uh, and a loom launched this year for the first time. Great. And so, you know, you, you said you're, you're trying to recreate the, the kind of African safari experience in a, in a little bit more of a, a tamer environment. Um, could you just give us a little bit of background into, into yourself and, and your husband's sort of backstory and, and mm. how um, you went from there to, to actually deciding to go for this and, and launching that, that first pilot location? Yeah, well, maybe the most interesting thing to note is that we did not have a background in hospitality. We did not have MBAs. Um, but we were, as Connor said at the beginning, definitely both pioneers. So my husband and I had both worked for aid agencies in our early 20s. And me first in Africa and then both uh, together in the Far East uh, thereafter. And I think one of the things that drove us both, still drives us both, is this idea of, I call myself an unashamed save the world kind of person, um, but we were sort of driven by trying to solve some of the world's big problems um, and got disillusioned with working for aid agencies because we really weren't feeling like we we're making enough progress, not really doing driving enough change, feeling like we were you know definitely making an impact on the direct people that we were working with, but but not driving any long lasting solutions. And that really started a, a journey into, questioning whether aid agencies were the right vehicle for driving the biggest change. Um, I went and did a master's, Nick, at the University of Manchester to answer this question, um, could business do also do good? So in my head, coming from an aid agency, business was like the dark side. I mean, it was like making money, capitalism was like this terrible evil in the world that was destroying our world and making people's lives terrible and all the rest of it and and so that was the place that was the, the starting point I was coming from and as I started to think about gosh business and business being a vehicle that really is about solving a problem any business 
you have a problem that you're trying to solve and you're trying to create a sustainable solution that makes money and drug creates a business. But this idea of could that sustainable, you know, problem solving vehicle actually do good as well as make money? And that was the question I started to wrestle with um, in the late 2000s uh, when I was sort of coming into my early 30s and burnt out from a career overseas uh, working for uh, non-profit organizations and really questioning what am I going to do with myself if I don't do this and how, is, <laughs> how am I going to save the world if this doesn't work? Um, but which started an amazing journey and started us thinking about um, different vehicles, different ideas. And this was really before impact investing was a thing. ESG was not a thing. You know, it was very, very early days with that, that kind of thinking. But it led us uh, to a crazy idea and led us to realize, well, if we want to do some good in the world and we think business is the answer, we better figure out having a business and starting a business. Hi everyone, Nick from Glampitech North America here and I've just got a very quick message to announce some extremely exciting news. Since launching in July 2022, Glampitech North America has made a name for itself in the North American glamping industry. We've consulted on over 40 glamping projects, accumulated over 47,000 podcast downloads and plays and we're now ready to take the next step. And with that, we're absolutely delighted to announce that we're beginning the process of developing our own glamping projects. We want you to be involved. There are more details to come, but for now, we're taking expressions of interest from prospective investors. We've assembled an absolutely all-star team to make this happen. And that includes a guy who sold his glamping business for over $5 million, as well as a director at Getaway, who are one of the biggest glamping companies in the world, and of course me. So we're so excited to get this going. It's been a long time coming and we can't wait to get you involved. So all you have to do is fill out the form in the description of this episode and we'll be in touch with more information very soon. We can't wait to hear from you and we'll speak to you soon. Bye-bye. Okay, so you you had your you went for your kind of pilot location, which um, if if I'm right, if my research has has been done properly, it didn't quite go as planned. It was it a disaster. Quite... <laughs> okay, well there you go. It was a disaster. Um, so that was you know I think the consensus was that, that the location wasn't quite right, and maybe you know you might have been okay in, in 2023 with the market the way it is but you know certainly when glamping wasn't necessarily necessarily a thing certainly in that economic climate as well um so 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 you went from kind of a, an initial failure um and and you you know bravely decided to, to go again which i think you know most people wouldn't even go for it in the first place let alone sort of go again after 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 an initial failure so tell us about about that decision and, and how you made that to to go from something that didn't quite work to um, to just going again and, and, and ultimately leading to, to the huge success that Under Canvas has been? Yeah, I think um, one of the sort of the most interesting things that often people get wrong when thinking about business is that they think there's a straight line between, you know, zero and hero. And there really isn't. There's really a lot of mistakes, a lot of failures, a lot of things that you wish you had done differently or that now you've got some knowledge and that you wouldn't do it like that again. And the reality is, is when you're starting anything for the first time, there's so much you don't know. And there's so many things to figure out. And if you're doing something that nobody's ever done before, like like we were, there's no frame of reference to go to and say, well, these guys do it like this. And so it must therefore work and I can do it like that. So that was really hard for us. Um, but what my biggest takeaway really was um, failures are just learning right? And the faster you learn, the faster you can get something right, the faster you can change, the faster you can hit a home run. And so what we did was we we understood what wasn't working, but we also understood what was working. Our, our failure was, was not like, well, everything about this is a failure. I mean, we weren't making any money, but there was something there. And we knew we had a product that people wanted because people were still calling us and people were wanting to ask, where do we get our tents? And, you know, where can I where can I do this and how can I do this? And there was something that we realized that there was demand in the market, that there was a product that people wanted. We just had to figure out how to serve the clients in a way that they actually wanted to be served rather than the way that we were originally serving them. Could you share a couple of those lessons from the first side of things? You were like, all right, we're definitely going to keep doing this and maybe we're going to not do not do this anymore. Yeah. Um, well, we started on my in-law, in-laws farm and ranch in Montana. 
which is, is in the middle of nowhere. Um, and so location was definitely a problem for us. It was really hard to convince people to come to us to trial an unknown concept, right, in an unknown place. That was too many unknowns for, for, for the guest. So, you know, the first thing is, how can you eliminate some of the barriers for your customer? How do you make something accessible to them? And certainly location was an inaccessible thing for them. So strike number one. But what we realized was that, that people did like our tents. So our product was good. What that was telling us was our product was good. There was interest, there was intrigue, there was desire, there was a fascination with this idea of sleeping out under the stars in a tent, but maybe the tent having a really nice bathroom and proper beds and lovely furniture and all the rest of it. So that that was that was a sort of a hard moment. It's like the, there's something here that's great about the product. The question is, is how are we executing and where are we executing and and how do we service guests and how do we attract guests and you know because this business is all about getting people to come and stay with you right and enjoy the experience that you want to provide for them so then you have to figure out what well, what do the customers really want and how do i reach them okay and you 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 know you, you pivoted you, you went for the second attempt and and this one was obviously much more successful um mm. you, it was right near um yellowstone national park am i right in saying Actually, that was my third attempt oh your third <laughs> failed my research what was, where was the I first had, one then? i had a second attempt in between those two things all oh, right <laughs> and the second attempt was we we started in a, a tent uh, event company so we took our glamping tents around the country for people's weddings events um family reunions, et cetera, et cetera, which was much more successful um, and people loved it. So we figured out, oh, maybe take the product to the people rather than trying to get the, the people to the product, um, which was a fantastic little business. But what I eventually realized about that business was it wasn't scalable and we, we, wanted, to, we wanted to build something that was uh, much bigger, had much more potential, um, and the event business really had a ceiling. And whilst it was a great business, um, there was a limit to what we thought we could do just because we were reliant on people hosting at their own events, um, which s- sparked the third idea, which was, um, can we still take the tents to the people? Can we still go where the people are going? Um, and can we give them an incredible tented hotel experience. Can we create, you know, events for them? So effectively, can we be your hotel for you um, outside of a national park? So that was our original final, final version of our concept. And how much of, and how much of the, the difference in success between the third attempt and the first attempt do you put down to the location? Um, I... Probably 90%. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, not just the location. I think the whole concept as a whole, we had a we had a very different business model with our first attempt. So our first attempt was a very small, private, upscale camp. Uh, we had four tents, was designed to be private, um, was seasonal, um, and uh, the, the audience was quite niche. So we definitely became more mainstream, um, became focused on, on serving a larger audience and figuring out how we attract a larger clientele. So location, definitely a big piece of that. Okay. And so, so this, you know, you finally, you finally got it right on, on this third attempt uh, and things, things were clearly going well and you were profitable. Um, some people might have just stopped there and, and just, you know, enjoyed that, 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 you know, profitable, successful uh, site where they can kind of change their lifestyle and maybe live, live, you know, off the land. But, but you decided to, to go, go bigger and scale and create what, what eventually became a, a nationwide brand. So, um, was that always the intention to really sort of go from location to location, location, or did you just wake up one day and just decide to, to go like that and, and, and say, we're going to scale this wake thing? up one day and decide <laughs> we were going to do that. Yeah. Um, it was, it was a bit of an aha moment really after, um, I will not lie. Our first season in Yellowstone was a complete chaos disaster zone. <laughs> we didn't know how to run a hotel one. Um, we didn't have enough staff. We were doing everything ourselves. 
I mean, it was exhausting. I had two young children. I had a three-year-old and a nine-month-old when we opened in Yellowstone, in our first year in Yellowstone. I was still nursing a baby. Um, so it, it was brutal. It was brutal on almost every front. Um, but in that madness, I realized, and after three years of trying to find a business model that worked, I realized we had something. I realized that demand that we had, um, the business model that, that we had started to create was actually working. It was, there was, there was something there There felt like that we had some substance, you know, we could have just doubled down and decided to improve what we had, um, which we did do. But at the same time, I just felt like if I, this is an opportunity and these kind of moments come around once in a lifetime, right? We kind of, I kind of felt like in my bones, I have a gift right here in my hands. We have, we have discovered something that has the potential to be truly extraordinary and we could do really great things. And remember my big drivers doing driving impact. And I just felt like if we could do something bigger, the impact that we could make through that company could be infinitely larger. And so that's really what, you know, I remember my, one of the staff, it was only six of us that first season and we had 35 tents up. So it was mental. Um, uh, one of my staff members <laughs> said to me at the end of the season, do you think you'll do this again? <laughs> <laughs> and I went, yeah, of course. And I'm going to do more of them. And he went, wait, what? <laughs> Are you crazy? And I'm like, yeah, I probably am crazy, but I think we're on to something. And there's a lot of work to do here. And we've got to polish this product and we've got to like refine the business and we've got to bring in people who know what they're doing. Um, and we've got to like organize this chaos. But I think we're on to something. Um, and whatever the business, you know, I, I think when you know, oh, I've got something, there's something here. There's just something. I can't put my fingers on it, but there's something here. And you, you've got to follow it and you've got to see what happens. I feel like um, if you can run your, your first season in Yellowstone, which is arguably the most difficult market from a seasonality perspective, I mean, it's it's for the listeners it's basically a four-month season and yellowstone gets the highest visitation of any national park in in the country maybe like even the world in those yeah. in those four months and then basically you know it might still be snowing in may and it will probably start snowing in early october september um, we've had snow we've had snow every year through the summer <laughs> yellowstone, even in august so yeah, the weather is brutal did it feel easier from there? Because you definitely didn't take the easy way out. Um, so I feel like if you can handle Yellowstone, yeah. the other locations must have been a little bit more manageable. Yeah, that's kind of what we always said to ourselves. Our, my husband and I, throughout our, our careers, have often said, you know, nothing will be as bad as Yellowstone. So if we could handle Yellowstone, you know, and arguably, you know, Yellowstone was make or break for, for us as a family and for this business idea. And if that didn't work, we were definitely done. Um, yeah. But, you know, we, we've looked back on it and gone, well, we survived that and we made that work and figured that out. So we can probably do anything. So it, def it definitely was one of those sort of water benchmark marks of like, this is a line in the sand. <laughs> yeah. What an entrepreneurial war story. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that year I could tell, we could spend the hour talking about war stories just from that first year. <laughs> I bet. I think I think everything you, you've said so far, you know, starting the first location, scaling is, is kind of easier said than done. There's, there's a whole load of, you know, it sounds straightforward looking back and when you've got 12 locations. But as you say, you, you're kind of in the trenches. You were literally we had Mike Munt, your, your friend Mike Munt on the podcast mm -hmm. uh, in the last episode and they were literally digging trenches. So you're quite literally in the trenches for the first few years. Yeah, um, and, and so, you know, when it when it came to, to, to beginning to scale um, again, probably easier said than done there's a lot that goes into that you probably had to professionalize a lot bring in some new people so was there anything uh, in particular that, that allowed you to that you would say looking back allowed you to to scale I don't know whether you would say you scaled smoothly but certainly um, scaled successfully was there anything you did any people you brought in etc that, that helped you do that yeah I brought in someone who needed who knew how to run a hotel that was by far and above the the most important and most uh the biggest thing I could have done to help us be successful I needed someone who could put systems and processes in place and help us run a professional organization um, and bringing a COO on was 
was effectively that that move for us. It kind of catapulted us from being mum and pop, you know, running a side hustle. It wasn't our side hustle, but you know, it was it was just doing it the way we thought we should do it, to doing things the way that that you know professional hotels do things, and that really set the company apart, I think, and really set the standard for hey, we're not just trying to. We are trying to create a new type of hotel. And I, as Connor, you said at the beginning, I think that was one of the most significant things for the industry was really this idea of we are a real asset class. We're not just a, a lifestyle bunch of hippies who want to create an alternative way to, you know, go on holiday. Um, this is a real asset class. This is a real business. This is it's a professional organization. And, and, you know, we want it to be like the, the Marriott of the outdoor hospitality space and you know be as professional as you know a major hotel company so that for me was was probably the most important and most significant thing we did and of course then it freed us up to think about growing right when I took someone on to handle the operations it freed me up to go think about okay where are we going to go next what are we going to do next how are we going to do that could you share a little bit more about what maybe like the big impact systems they brought in like was it uh reservation management system room turnover service uh you know advertising or like anything in particular about like what was really high impact and smoothing that out all of the above but i i think you know have hiring proper staff staffing our our business appropriately and properly understanding how you know room turnovers should be done and doing them efficiently and managing people efficiently um i still probably manage most of our marketing and our reservations but but putting in a property management system and so that we could you know track rooms better and uh, just operate efficiently and uh, have real systems in place you know for ordering product and replacing supplies and all of those things became really important are you able to share which uh reservation management system software you guys used i don't even remember I don't even remember. I, I've been through a few, and each time we switched one, it was a very painful, horrible experience. I probably have blocked it into the trauma zone somewhere out there. So um, I don't even remember who we used first. What would be like a typical staffing model if you had a, a fift, like a 50-unit property? What would you be thinking of like, okay, here's, here's the staff that we need to run this property successfully? It depends um, largely on how the kind of level of service that you're wanting to provide, right? So there's a very there's so much variation in the glamping space between, you know, a two star or a three star or a four star and a five star place, right? So um, it really depends on whether you're wanting to provide daily housekeeping or not, or whether you're wanting people to bring their own bedding or not. Um, and so there's no there's no magic formula for if you've got 50 tents, you need X number of people. Um, and I certainly would not be the person to ask because I am not the operational expert. Um, but um, there's, a, there's a lot of science around, you know, what, what service are you trying to achieve and what people is it going to take to be able to make that a reality? That's really the bigger question. Hi, everyone. Thanks for listening. This is just a quick note to say that this podcast is brought to you by Glamper Techs in North America. And what we do is we help you through the process of starting a glamping business, no matter what stage you're at. So if you need to find a property, we'll tell you where the most suitable area is to start your glamping business. If you have a property, we'll look at your local zoning code and tell you how likely you are to get your project off the ground according to the zoning rules and regulations in your local area. We'll also give you a really good roadmap of permits that you'll need and regulations that you need to be aware of to get your glamping business off the ground if you need financing we'll introduce you to our range of financing partners and do you a feasibility study that will give you some really solid financial projections and market analysis that will allow you to acquire the funding that you need if you need glamping units we'll talk you through your options and introduce you to one of our trusted manufacturing partners to ensure that you're looked after throughout the whole process If you need a site design or if you need permits to move forward with your project, we've got architects who will do all your drawings, make all your arguments and essentially allow your dream to become a reality. The list goes on and I don't want to bore you, so I'll let you get back to the episode in a second. All I'd say is that Glamper Techs North America are the people to speak to about starting a glamping business in the US or Canada. So if you're even thinking of starting a glamping business, just get in touch with us at contact at 
or 646 586 2330. All the details are in the description and no matter what stage of the process you're at, we will be able to help, whether it's doing something ourselves or pointing you in the right direction of our partners. Just let us know that you came from the podcast and we'll see about doing you a little discount along the way. So thanks for listening and I'll let you get back to the episode. And so, you know, as, as you start to scale, you know, you, it's, it's, it, you went through the, the fundraising process, you went through a few trials and tribulations um, throughout that process. So tell us a little bit about that, how, how you know, you decided to, to raise money to, to expand and what that process looks like and, and the issues you ran into doing that as well. Yeah, well, as you alluded to at the beginning, um, fundraising for an industry that was not yet an industry was exceptionally hard. And it took me a very long time to raise to raise capital, um, largely because, you know, we weren't a tech company. And every time I met someone, I said, well, you're not tech. This is not going to be valuable. Uh, and of course, that was nonsense. Of course, I was going to build something of value. I just didn't understand the sort of the parameters that people were thinking about and not necessarily approaching the right kind of investors. And the other kind of, you know, when I started to look at real estate kind of investors, the other struggle was, well, we don't really have real estate that's really valuable because the kind of land that I'm using is, is not got alternative uses. It can't be, we can't put condos on it. You know, we're not going to build houses across it. So real estate investors weren't really getting it either. So um, it was a, it was a very frustrating, very challenging um, space to be moving in. And that's part of the problem of going first. And I call that my my blessing and my curse of of always trying to pioneer something and go first because it's really hard plowing ground when no one has plowed it before you and you know glamping certainly wasn't a thing you know I was still having to explain the whole concept to people and people were not really buying it that it was it was you know people that it was going to be even vaguely interesting so um it was very painful (laughs) And um, it's still very slow. And I think the sad part about um, the space still is that it's still, because of the lack of collateral, because of the lack of traditional assets, it's still quite a difficult space for people to get funding in. You know, ultimately, our first break came from our local bank. And I still believe, you know, local banks have a really big a role to play in supporting small business and helping local people get small businesses off the ground. And that's really what our bank did for us. I, I should never forget the conversation I had um, when finally, I think it must have been after my third or fourth, maybe even fifth conversation with local bankers, where one of them finally said they would accept tents as collateral and that I could have an equipment loan for, for buying tents. I could have fallen off my, my chair. Um, uh, and just the fact that they considered the tents to be collateral um, was was an amazing gift to us. It was really, truly incredible. So that was that was what really helped us in the early days, along with a lot of credit cards that I was juggling balances on. <laughs> there's there's the risk again, you know, taking risks in an industry that kind of hadn't really been pioneered with anyone previously. So again, as as Connor said, there's there's a lot that's owed to you for, for keeping plowing on and, and your resilience and determination. So again, thank you for that. Um as as the years went on a little bit, obviously presumably you got a little bit more secure in, in how the business was doing and you had uh, you know several locations and then towards the end of, of the twenty tens you you received uh, you you're essentially acquired by a, a private equity firm. Uh, and that which you know rewarded you financially for all those years of hard work and the trials and tribulations um so first of all how did that opportunity come about and then how did it feel when you check your bank account the next day (laughs) well um the company was on a financial knife edge until we raised our first sort of significant amount of of capital the, the year prior to when we sold um which was 2017 and so we literally had had sort of eight years of financial precariousness. And whilst the, the business had been profitable, every year we ploughed everything we had back into growing and scaling the business and, and servicing our debt. And we had, you know, sizable amounts of, of, of debt at this point. So every season was, was nerve wracking and every season was, was challenging. Um, and it wasn't until sort of we... We really raised a very large amount of capital, which was about, I think it was $14 million, $17 million, um, that that really put the company on a different setting and a different financial footing. 
Um, and, you know, I just went out to raise capital again the next year because we deployed all the capital we'd raised on opening more sites. Um, and that was, was when a surprising offer came down the pike and um, it was too good to turn down. And you, you had a, I was listening to another podcast with you on the other day and, and you had a funny story about what happened when um, <laughs> you came home all excited to, to share the news that you'd just been acquired for a significant sum of money and it wasn't quite the, the reception yeah. that you were hoping for. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we I'd spent any any time you're ever doing a deal with, you know, big, big money, it's, it's, it's an arduous and complicated and painful process. And I'd been slaving over getting this deal done um, for months. I mean, it had been a sort of three, four month journey. And the day it finally closed and we sold the majority of the company to a private equity fund um, and the money moved, I got the phone call, the money's in the bank. I, 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 well, first I cried because I was emotionally exhausted and just couldn't believe that it, that it was done. Um, and then I was ready to go celebrate. It was four days before Christmas. It was the 21st of December. And I was, we were going on holiday for a few weeks. We were going to, we were close the office. Everyone was done. Deal was done. Ready to kick back. Oh, pop the champagne. My husband and I drove home from the office and my in-laws were at home with our kids ready to, you know, come and celebrate Christmas with us. And my mother-in-law standing at the, the door and she <laughs> whispered, the kids are vomiting as I walked in the door. And I was like, what? She said, I think they've got norovirus. And she was right. They, they both had norovirus, which meant everybody then got norovirus for the next, in succession over the next two weeks. So <laughs> I spent two weeks post the sale of Under Canvas with my mom hat on cleaning up vomit uh, and mopping everybody's brow and vomiting myself <laughs> and trying to have a nice Christmas all of the time, which, which wasn't really a reality. So it, it definitely was like, if you're, you know, thinking about, you know, you're, you're something and you've made it and, you know, you're, you're on the top of the world. This moment certainly sort of brought us back down to earth. And I was like, well, now here's the reality. <laughs> You're still a mom and you still have little kids and uh, people are still vomiting in your world so well, it's, uh, it's like that question you know is, is it is it better to cry in a terrible car or in a ferrari so is it better to have norovirus when you <laughs> when you have loads of money or not <laughs> norovirus is pants for whatever your circumstances it's not a winner you are not thinking about your bank account when you're when you're throwing your guts up that's for sure I'll bear that in mind in the future. Um, so, so when we had Mike Munt on in the last episode, he he was saying, you know, as much as it's been a huge success now, there were obviously some very difficult moments um, throughout the whole journey, um, and and you've obviously alluded to a few. Uh, was there one particular moment that was really difficult that that you really had to sort of grit your teeth and, and battle through um, along the way? I'd say my worst two moments probably were fundraising. For one, fundraising for Under Canvas, and two, maybe that first year in Yellowstone. Um, I mean, there were so many things that went wrong that year. We had a massive storm roll through at one point in the summer and it completely flattened the camp. I mean, I, 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 was, I, I was sitting, we, we were living on site at the time in a camper and my husband was away doing another event because uh, we still were doing events at that time as well. I was in the, I had five members of staff and me and I was in the camper with my two small children biggest storm I have ever been in certainly sitting in a camper rolled through the camp and the camper was literally you know swaying from the wind the, the wind and I was thinking at one point is this camper gonna like roll over should I get out with the kids and try and get into another vehicle and um eventually passed as as storms always do um but when I opened the door I looked out at the camp and it was flat like everything we had was on the ground. There were tent poles broken, canvas, you know, things blown over. I mean, it was carnage. I mean, how anyone ever trusted us to stay in a tent again? I have no idea. But we did hurricane proof them after that. We designed them so they could stand up to, you know, 180 mile an hour winds, which they always do now. But at the time, I was like, we're, we're done. 
this is this is it. No one will trust us again. No one will stay with us again. We're going to go bust because I'm going to have to give everyone's money back. And now I've already spent everybody's money. So I don't know how I'm going to do that. Um, so <laughs> it was traumatic. And all I wanted to do in that moment was quit. I wanted to go hide. I was embarrassed. I was afraid. And I just wanted to, I just wanted to go home. I just wanted to like disappear like the have the earth swallow me up and like I just walk away from the carnage and I tell you if it hadn't have been for one member of my staff who said to me this was my maintenance guy who'd also said to me you're going to do more of these um he said to me I don't think it's that bad I think we can come back from this and I'm like I said to him wait what <laughs> and and he's like no it's not that bad I'm calling Jake and I'm crying, my husband, and I'm crying on the phone. Saying, it's all, it's all, it's all terrible. And he says to me, give me the phone. He looks at me and says, you stop, like, you stop that right now. You pull yourself. I mean, he didn't say these things, but he looked at me as if to say, you get your shit together. Like, come on, you can do this. He speaks to my husband and he says, this isn't this bad. We can sort this. I've got this. We can put this camp back together. We've got spare poles. I'm going to call all our neighbors who can come and help us. And that's what we did. You know, he gave me the eye. I said, okay, I'm pulling myself together. I'm pulling myself back together. And, uh, you know, I have to stop focusing on disaster and have to start focusing on solutions. And that's often what happens in a business, right? We can get so fixated on what's not going right that we forget to focus on finding solutions to our problems. Because... Building a business is basically solving one problem after another problem, after another problem, after another problem, after another problem. And that's really what growing and scaling a business looks like. It's just constant problem solving. And so the faster you get at, at solving big problems and solving things that are not going right, the faster that things will go right. So we we called everyone we knew in West Yellowstone. All our neighbors showed up. Our guests started pitching in and putting back tents up and we started doling out dry bedding. Uh, and by 11 o'clock that night, we had everyone back in their bed. I didn't give a single refund out. We had the tent look, tents looking back to normal um, and we were good to go. And, you know, that was a, was a moment that was either kind of like, we're done or no, no, we're going to overcome and we're going to, we're going to keep fighting to fight another day and it certainly was a was a was one of those moments um and and without the support of many people i would have given up that day for sure i don't get the sense that that uh, you know in your case it was your husband but just in general having a partner with you and also a, a wider team behind you really really has helped you in, in all aspects of this business yeah I, it's really hard doing things by yourself especially because it's not just a physical journey right it's also an emotional journey and you know there are days when it really gets you down it gets to you it feels like it's too much or it's too hard and so um when there's someone else you know in in it with you who also cares about it as much as you care about it, um, they can help you get back up again. And sometimes we just need each other to help getting back up, you know. Mm -hmm. Even, you know, silly things like uh, Connor saying to me today, like, hey, this is what, do you know what you did? Do you know that if you hadn't have done what you've, that you'd have done? Um, which makes me think, oh, that's why I keep, that's why I keep pioneering, right? That's why I keep breaking up ground um, to make things happen so other people can come behind us and do other things. But there are days when pioneering really gets gets my goat. And I'm thinking, what what am I doing? <laughs> this is too hard. This is too difficult. I don't want to keep doing this. But then and then something happens when you just know, no, oh, no, I can I can. I can keep going. I can keep, you know, keep doing what I do and keep persevering. But we need each other and you know, we need partners, we need supporters, we need encouragers. We need a village, uh, and, you know, and, and pioneering anything, building anything, doing anything for the first time. You need you need champions around you to keep helping you get back up when you're knocked down. OK. And so you, you've you know, you, you sold the business and, and you, you still I think I think you're still kind of 
um, involved in it a little bit, but not not obviously to the extent that you were five years ago. Uh, and, you, and you've moved on to, to two new ventures, uh, Enigma Ventures and uh, the Quiver Tree Collection. So could you just tell us a little bit more about those and, and what you're doing day to day now? Yeah, my, my two current pioneering new endeavours are um, we have a small venture capital fund investing in female entrepreneurs in Africa. That's Enigma Ventures. Um, and so one of my frustrations with being a female founder uh, was it was really hard as a female to, to raise capital. Less than 2% of all venture funding is going to women. So one of the things I wanted to do post-selling under Canvas was invest and support other women in growing and scaling their businesses. So when we launched Enigma, we were the first fund of its kind in Africa to be investing in women and saying that investing in women is a thing. Again, nobody was wanting to believe me at the time. <laughs> but now there are a few other funds that are also have a mandate to invest in women across the continent, which has been fantastic to see. And then there's Quivertree. So Quivertree Collection is our next um, hospitality endeavor, um, working on building a global portfolio of outdoor hospitality endeavors around the world that are primarily focused on conservation, biodiversity, preservation, and, and using hospitality as a vehicle for preserving and protecting some of the most incredible, vulnerable places around the world. Connor, I know, you, I know you're kind of passionate about about the, the, the sort of sustainable aspect and sort of doing good through through business. Have you got any sort of questions on, 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 on Enigma particularly? About Enigma in particular, I would guess I would say if... Um... If there was, a, if you had any advice for for female entrepreneurs or anyone like trying to raise capital in, in, in their passion or, or their vision, maybe would you have any advice for them? Yeah, um, I've just written a book which is coming out next year, which I'm very very excited about, which is consolidating all of my advice for female entrepreneurs because I have endless amounts of it. Um, the book's called Thinking Bigger. Um, and it'll be out sometime next year. Um, so if folks want to follow me either on LinkedIn, um, LinkedIn's probably the best way to, to connect with me. Um, I can certainly uh, direct people to, to, to put, getting their hands on my book, Thinking Bigger, um, next year. But yeah, I mean, it is a challenging landscape for, for women entrepreneurs in particular. It's a challenging landscape period right now just because uh, the capital markets are in a big slump and we've had obviously rising interest rates for almost a year now. So um, it's it's a very challenging times. But what I would say is during ta- for everyone, during challenging times, there are always opportunities. So it's just a question. Of, it's not a question of... Um, will I get funded or could I get funded? It's just, it's a question of, of, of how do you find your window of opportunity? If you, if you keep looking and keep persevering and don't give up and figure out how you can use your circumstances to your advantage, um, that's really the key. Um, and recognizing that, you know, in, in difficult times, the, 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 the most capable, the most creative, the most, determined will find a way the question is just whether are you going to be one of those people I, I love it and i i look i look forward to reading the book um i guess a, a follow-up question when when you were going through your fundraising efforts with with under canvas i guess even in having this conversation it kind of again shows me just how remarkable it was what you were able to do in, in the rounds that you that you raised is probably no one had raised any sort of significant amount of money in the u.s in glamping and only you know two percent of, of venture capital funding goes to women. I guess, what with under canvas in particular, what would you attribute that success to, or like how how did you approach the fundraising, or is there anything that you could point to? Was it was it the land? Was it your historicals or the brand or how you did your pitch deck presentation? It really was a combination. I I think bootstrapping really helped us actually. Because, you know, and often people, as you can imagine, come to me to fund them all the time or to give them advice about getting funded. Um, But really bootstrapping our business was the best thing I possibly ever could have done, especially in a nascent space that is unproven and unknown. But having real financial credentials and a business model that I could show um, had traction, had um, was was really absolutely the key to that. So I could show performance. 
You know, and really that's what speaks loudest to investors, right? What have you done so far? Ideas are cheap, right? Everybody has ideas. Everybody wants to open a glamping site on their favorite piece of land. Everybody does, right? But what can you prove that you have already made happen, that you've already got off the ground? And I am not talking as someone who came at this with a trust fund of money that, you know, daddy gave me. I didn't have anything. We were living on food stamps. You know, I had two small children, no income, and I was juggling credit cards to pull off our dream. So that matters to investors, right? What skin have you got in the game? What are you doing to make your dream a reality? What is it costing you to pull off? You know, I sold it. We sold everything. We had nothing other left than other what we put in the business. So don't sit in your four bedroom house and your car and your boat and all the rest of it and ask somebody to fund your dream. Go fund your dream, make it happen, show what you can pull off and then people will join you. They're not going to join you on a, on a, on a wild hair you've got a great idea that's not how this works amazing we have we have a, a large audience of, of female uh, listeners to this podcast as well uh, and and i get f- uh, calls quite a lot um from a lot of women who are looking to start a glamping business and do you have any advice to them specifically for for navigating the kind of male dominated landscape landscape of venture capital and, and and all that kind of fundraising kind of thing yeah i would just say talk in the right language you 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 have to and the language that speaks the louder is just good metrics right good metrics great vision and a great plan investors are looking for people who have a great plan they've got a good track record and they they all they need is capital to execute on the plan so you know how robust is your plan how viable are your numbers how how um, how have you proven what you've done so far? How good are your numbers so far? If, you're, if your num- numbers are half asked already, don't go out there until you've got good numbers, right? Because no one's going to take you seriously. So understand the metrics that matter. Growth matters. Revenue matters. Profitability matters. So uh, work on that and borrow against your house. Borrow from, <laughs> borrow from your friends and family. You know, if you believe in you, and you're prepared to put your own money in the thing, someone else will too. It's really difficult to get anyone else to believe you and back you if you are not backing you. That's what I would say. So much gold in there. <laughs> we're actually in our in one of our next episodes, we're gonna be talking specifically about fundraising. So that's a that's an awesome just mm-hmm. little sneak peek or, or intro. And, yeah, and, and in the world that we live in, which is basically we stand in between owners and operators and investors, and yeah, it's it's so hugely important. Mm-hmm. And so we we um, end every podcast episode with with a with a any podcast episode that we record with a, a glamping operator. We we ask the same question to finish it off every time. Um, the answer is always the same, and uh, I think your, yours will be the, the strongest yes we've ever had. But um, Sarah, are you happy with your decision to start a glamping business? Absolutely yes. There we go. That's all that we need. Um, so, Connor, thank you for, for coming on as, as your first um, co-hosted episode. We'll, be, we'll have you back on once a month or so. Uh, Sarah, it's been an absolute pleasure. Uh, I think Connor said it all in the intro as to, as to what we owe to you in the industry. So um, thank you for giving up your time to coming on. And, and this episode, as Connor just said, is, is packed full of, of gold for prospective operators. So um, thank you again. My pleasure.